Chapter 3. Peter. A girl's scream pierced through the calm of the forest, jolting me out of my deep sleep. I had never heard another human so close to my camper, and this one was hurt. By the sound of it, she was hurt badly. I ran swiftly toward the noise, trying to keep my adrenaline in check as the pine needles and leaves crunched under my feet. The fastest way to her was not the way I would usually go. Sticky spiderwebs tried to hold on to me and failed. Thorns also tore at my clothes and tried to slow me down, some even nicking my skin, but I was needed, and I would not stop. I kept reminding myself that I was not in danger. I was only helping someone else. Everything was going to be fine. I could stay myself. There was no need for the wolf to come out. I was not upset. She continued to scream like a beacon in the night, drawing me closer. The wind whipped at my back, whistling through the leaves in the trees and pushing me toward her. When I arrived at the scene, I saw with surprise that the injured girl was the beautiful thief from the market. Why was she out this far? Was she sleeping out in these woods too? Was she starving and homeless? A boy knelt down beside her, assessing her bleeding arm with a panicked look on his face. Brooke, calm down and tell me what happened, he pleaded, taking her face in his hands. He looked as confused as I was. Brooke. The thief's name was Brooke. I took in the scene, not knowing if they had noticed me yet. They both seemed preoccupied as they looked at her arm. My adrenaline spiked as I saw her shorts were down past her knees. My body shuddered with righteous rage. Had he tried to assault her? If so, it would be the last thing he ever did. I was going to kill him. The wolf was coming out, and I wasn't even sure if I wanted to stop it. He deserved it. My skin started to shift. I was going to tear him apart for... I came over here to go to the bathroom, and when I was pulling my shorts up, I fell on this branch. Now stop asking me questions and make the pain stop, she yelled through her tears. He seemed concerned about her and genuinely surprised by the story. Was she telling the truth? I breathed slowly, in through my nose and out through my mouth. My body had already begun to shift, and with my heightened senses, I smelled her urine, solidifying her story. I continued to breathe slowly as I stepped forward to reveal myself. My legs were still human. I was still human. The only threat here was a wound. Everything was fine. The boy looked up at me in surprise, then back to Brooke and said, The cut is bad. It's bleeding like crazy. Come on, let's get you to the hospital. She shook her head violently, biting her lip to keep from screaming. Up close, I could see that she was covered in dirt. Gone was the well-kept girl I had seen earlier. The woods had claimed her. The boy stared up at me again, his expression a mixture of fear and anger. I wondered if he was as skeptical about my role in Brooke's wound as I was about his, or if he was simply afraid to run into someone in the deep woods of Midnight Springs. I leaned down and took her arm in my hand. She flinched as she realized another person was there, but calmed when she saw it was me. I fed her. She trusted me. Brooke, listen to him, I said. The cut was deep and jagged. She would definitely need stitches. I can't go to a hospital, she cried, whipping her head back and forth to look for support from one of us. Look at how much pain you're in. It wasn't a question. I'm taking you to the hospital now, the boy argued. Let's go. You know it's quite a walk to my car, and we need to get you there as fast as we can. She looked into my eyes, pleading with me to understand. I swore and looked away as the realization hit me. If the girl couldn't afford food, she most likely didn't have health insurance. She couldn't afford to go to the hospital. She wouldn't go unless she was on the brink of death. I did a mental check of all of the first aid supplies I had in my camper. While I would have had enough to make a quick fix for myself, it wasn't nearly good enough for her. She needed real help. She needed better than what I could offer her. Okay. I know where we can go instead, I said, lifting her to her feet with her good arm. I had the unsettling urge to brush some of the dirt and leaves off her back, but I didn't think it would be appropriate. She nodded to me as a thank you, reaching down with her good hand to pull up her shorts. Jeff, help me, she said, unable to use her other hand. He carefully pulled up the left side of her shorts and ran his hands around the waistband to make sure they were on correctly. Then he wiped off everything I wanted to reach out and help with but couldn't. I should have been relieved that he was affectionate toward her, that he wasn't the reason she was hurt, but I still struggled to keep my rage contained. I didn't want him to touch her. I didn't want him anywhere near her. 
There was something I didn't like about him, but I couldn't put my finger on it yet. She still struggled to breathe normally through the pain. I focused on her instead of my anger, taking off my shirt and ripping it into shreds. I wrapped the wound with it, trying to ignore her yelps as I put pressure on it to slow the bleeding. She needed it. It was for her own good. I might have been hurting her at the moment, but I was actually helping her. I had to remind myself of that over and over, every time her cries made me want to quit. I had spent so long in the woods alone caring for myself. It was a whole other beast trying to care for another person. I scooped her up in my arms and began walking toward Mr. Atkins' house. Jeff protested, but I ignored him. He fell into step behind me, determined to go wherever she was going. I would have been fine if he had stayed behind. I almost came out and told him he didn't have to come, but decided it was futile. After all, he didn't know me. He wouldn't leave this girl alone with a stranger. At first, she held her head up, alert and curious about where I was taking her. Then, as I weaved through the trees and brush, she settled into me, resting her head on my bare chest. Her breathing was still irregular, but she had stopped screaming for the time being. The mating call of the cicadas rang out all around us, calming me. I hoped it calmed her, too. I was going to take care of her. She was going to be okay. The warm breeze made my long hair whip in my face, but I couldn't move it away because my hands were occupied with something much more precious. I would need to cut my hair soon if it was getting long enough to impair my vision like this. Thank you, she whispered. I tilted my head down to meet her eyes, careful not to slow my stride. You're welcome, I whispered back. I squeezed her body slightly, holding her closer to me. Even though the night was warm, her warmth felt good. I got the sinking feeling that, at the end of this adventure, it would be hard to let her go. When we made it to the clearing of Mr. Atkins' yard, I looked up to see that the sky was cloudy and dark. No stars were in sight, making it impossible to tell what time it was. I knew it had to be late, though. I felt like I had slept for a while before she woke me. I hoped we wouldn't scare the old man. He didn't deserve that. If I could have, I would have kept him out of it. But I needed help, and I didn't know where else to go. On the porch, I motioned with my head for Jeff to knock on the door. He obeyed my silent command, and we waited. Jeff shifted from foot to foot, looking over at Brooke's arm but saying nothing. It was hard to pinpoint why I didn't like the guy, but I was certain I didn't. After what took entirely too long, the porch light came on. My face shifted down at the sudden brightness, forcing me to see just how bloody Brooke's clothes were. My shirt had slowed the bleeding, but was quite saturated itself. My chest tightened in fear. Was this the wrong call? Did she need a hospital? Was I going to have to make her go? Mr. Atkins looked right at her as soon as he opened the door, most likely as concerned as I was. He was in a floor-length light blue nightshirt and glasses. What's going on? he asked, looking at me for answers. In his own way, he had always made sure I knew I could come to him if I had needed help. I bet he didn't think I would actually do it one day, and bring company. Jeff popped up instead when silence took my own voice. She fell in the woods and cut her arm badly. Our friend said we should come here for help. I tried not to wince at his careless use of the word friend, but when Mr. Atkins looked back at me for confirmation, I nodded in agreement. He opened the door for us, draped an old ratty blanket over a recliner, and motioned for me to put her there. He covered her with a lush, fluffy brown blanket, looked me in the eye, and pointed to the kitchen. I followed him, leaving Brooke and Jeff in the living room. I didn't like leaving her alone with him, but she trusted him, right? She was safe with him, wasn't she? How bad is it? he asked, keeping his voice low. He peered over his glasses at me. Do I need to call an ambulance? I shook my head and took a deep breath before responding. She needs stitches, but she won't go. She doesn't have insurance. He cursed, looking off into the distance as if he were thinking. I had so many things I wanted to say to the man, but they didn't come out. I didn't picture our first real conversation going this way. I'll get what you need, but I can't stitch it myself. My hands aren't steady enough, he said, meeting my eyes again. It looked like it pained him to admit that he couldn't do something. I nodded. I'll do it. Thank you. He nodded back and wordlessly went to get what we needed to stitch her up. I almost called after him to let him know that thank you covered a multitude of things. But I didn't. Could I even list the things he had done for me? More than that, could I even fathom how he had asked for nothing in return? 
I washed my hands in his kitchen sink, which smelled horrid from old food caked on dishes. My hands were dirt-stained, but I hoped they would be clean enough to not give Brooke an infection. I dried them with a floral hand towel that most likely belonged to his wife. I wasn't sure how long it had been since she passed, but by the look of things, he hadn't changed much around the house since he lost her. He may not have cleaned since then, either. I could sense the tension in the air the moment I stepped foot in the living room. Jeff was pacing with his phone to his ear. Had he called the ambulance anyway? Man, this guy was getting under my skin, which was a dangerous place for him to be. He might be lucky to survive the night. Baby, I am so sorry. I was camping, and I missed your call. I'll come get you right away, he said softly to the phone. Baby? Who was he calling baby? I looked at Brooke, confused. I couldn't read her to get any further answers, though. Her face wore so many different kinds of pain as her eyes fixed on the old stained carpet. Everything about the house was old and stained. I expected it to be nicer on the inside. There was clutter, trash, and dirt everywhere. Aside from running water, the man's living conditions weren't much better than mine. I'll be there soon. Love you, he said to the phone. He looked at me briefly, wearing something that looked like guilt, then walked to Brooke's side like he was walking through water. I'm so sorry, he said as he bent down to her eye level. She still didn't look at him. It'll be better soon, I promise. You'll see. When she didn't reply, he kissed her forehead and walked out. He looked at war with himself. I recognized that expression well. It was difficult having a second set of hands on the wheel in your mind. It was more than enough for any man to handle. I wasn't the type of guy to pry, and Brooke didn't seem to be in the mood to explain, so we sat in silence. It felt strange to be curious, to want to ask a question, and not feel like I could. She cried softly, and I didn't know if the tears were from physical or emotional pain. Either way, each tear tore through me. Where's the third one? Mr. Atkins asked as he entered with his hands full of supplies, peeking around the room as if Jeff would jump out and surprise him. My ears perked up, and I hoped Brooke would explain, but she didn't. Mr. Atkins, who was always good at reading situations, picked up the hint and saved her. He was probably squeamish and couldn't handle the sight of blood, he muttered as he set everything down on the coffee table. Seems like quite a little pansy to me anyway. When Brooke met his eyes, he winked. A small smile crossed her pained face. The list of everything Mr. Atkins had done for me continued to grow and grow. I would never be able to thank him enough. I pulled a heavy dining room chair next to Brooke's recliner and started unwrapping her arm. What are you doing? she asked, pulling away from me. I have to stitch it, I stated, reaching back for the arm. She kept it away from me. You're going to stitch it? she asked, wide-eyed. Her whole body backed into the far corner of the recliner. I started getting irritated. Yes, I'm going to stitch it. It's me or the hospital. You choose. She truly considered this. Have you ever given someone stitches before? I shrugged. Only myself. She sighed, no doubt realizing as she looked around the room that I was her best option. She held her arm back out for me, and I finished unwrapping it. I'm going to clean it now. It shouldn't hurt, I said, pouring bottled water on a washcloth. She whimpered but didn't pull away. After I got most of the blood off, I washed it again with peroxide. The wound bubbled up, which launched her into hysteria. What's wrong? Is that supposed to happen? What will we do? Should we go to the hospital? Is it infected? There were too many questions at once. It made my brain hurt. Nothing. Yes. Nothing. No. No. I answered, wiping some dirt out of the wound and pouring more peroxide on it. Excuse me? she asked, with a little too much attitude considering all I was doing for her. Nothing is wrong. It's supposed to do that because it's cleaning it so it doesn't get infected later. Everything is fine, I explained. Had the girl never used peroxide before? Had she never been hurt before? She whimpered as I continued to clean it. I breathed a sigh of relief as I was able to get the last bit of dirt out of it. Step one was complete. After the cut was cleaned, it didn't look as bad as it had earlier. I got the needle, disinfected it, and started to thread it. What's that? she asked, pointing to the thread. Fishing line, I said. Surely she had seen fishing line before. Her eyes bugged out at me, then up to Mr. Atkins. You don't have regular thread? Helen did, but it's not good for something like this. That kind of thread is made up of tiny fibers that could get in the wound, he explained. The fishing line should be sturdy and pliable enough to use for stitches. It's the better option. She didn't argue, but she looked like she wanted to run away. When she glanced at the door, I figured she was considering it. Everything is fine, I said, both to her and myself. 
We had to get through this with as little drama as possible so the wolf wouldn't come out. Bite down on this, Mr. Atkins said, handing her an old belt of his, and don't look. She listened, turning her face away from me. I started weaving the thread through her delicate skin, thankful I had brought her here and had the light to help me see what I was doing. I wouldn't have been able to do as good of a job in the woods. She shrieked through clenched teeth but left her arm in my possession as I sewed it up. Every sound of pain she made compelled me to stop, but I trudged through it. I was helping her. Everything was fine.